All right, we're going to go ahead and get started this afternoon. Make sure this is high enough up. So does everyone have a clicker? That Did you get one when you came in? Does anyone need a little square clicker? All right, great. So I have been instructed to inform you that these will not work, your TV at home. They will not work, your garage door, all right? They, in fact, will not work anything unless you have turning point technology. So who has turning point technology? All right, okay. Everyone else has absolutely no use for these after today. Uh, but in all seriousness, we really do need to collect them at the end of today. Emmett will be uh, back there with um, my with a collection bin. Please drop them in after you leave. We are filming this. We will know. <laughs> okay. All right, great. So um, uh, these are going to be used at certain points in this afternoon's presentation. Uh, I'm talking about the ADR landscape, which literally is just that. And in fact, it is about a 300-page document. So I figured if I'm going to talk about this, there better be a way to make it interactive uh, for you all. It's also the end of the day. So that is my uh, goal, as to create those opportunities for you. So please do not click the clicker until the actual question comes up. Uh, and it should be self-explanatory at that point. And for all of you, your answers are entirely anonymous. All right, so you can be rest assured that we will not know which selection uh, you made when we get to that point. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the uh, ADR landscape. This is, as we discussed this morning, one of the early things that was done with the research um, so that we could really gain an understanding of what is happening in the field of ADR here in, in Maryland. So what did we look at? Let's see. If, all right. We looked at court-affiliated programs. And so I do, we've been talking about this a lot today. I'm not sure we ever fully defined it. So these are programs that have some sort of connection with the court. Right. So the court is actually said we will be providing ADR uh, and we will be working uh, with either a direct provider within the court or with a partner to provide that service. So private practices are not included in this. Community mediation centers themselves were not studied as a part of this, but to the extent that they are partners in programs that are administered by the court, they were included. It was any ADR process. We knew going into this that what people say is mediation, what people do, what they call. We didn't want to get all muddied in that. If the court is telling the user this is what it is, then that's what we're going to call it for the purposes of landscape, at least. The interviews were with the people who are actually responsible for managing the programs. Right. Um, they were face-to-face -face interviews for most part, and it was descriptive programmatic information. So I'm not asking if you had one thing uh, that you wanted to improve your program, what would that be, right? These are actual kind of factual data-driven information. The data was collected from 2010 to 2013, but the majority of the programmatic data reflects about 2011, 2012. Through the information that was gathered, the, the landscape highlights, yeah. The mic cutting it out. Yeah. That's fine. I can do that. Um, so we looked at each individual program, uh, and each one is profiled specifically in the landscape. But it also pulled out uh, some trends and themes. And so today, I'm just going to focus on three of them. The growth of ADR, program evaluation, quality control, and access to All right. So first question. How many court-affiliated programs exist in America? A, B, C, or D? All right. Let's see if this works. Everyone ready? All right, I only have like 20 minutes of this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready? Uh, 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 uh. It should. Uh, 55 responses, right? Yeah. Yeah. There, uh, there you go. There we 
go. All right. So, uh, so I'm sorry. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so uh, the majority of you responded with answer B, 25 to 49. The actual response is D. There's about 80 different court-affiliated ADR programs in Maryland. All right? I will not. I told you the answers are anonymous. All right. So let's see how they break down. Okay, so uh, we have the, at the Court of Special Appeals, right? So we have ADR at every level of court here in Maryland. Court of Special Appeals, Circuit Court breaks down among uh, general civil, domestic programs, uh, juvenile as well. Uh, at the time, there were two programs within the Orphans Court um, and District Court uh, offering ADR in civil and criminal matters. Okay, so when was the first court-affiliated ADR program? When, what, when did it begin? All right, A, B, C, or D? It is now 2016. <laughs> okay, all right. All right. And 31% of you are correct. The first program was in 1982. Uh, the programs were the domestic program within Prince George's County and the criminal mediation program in Anne Arundel County started in 1982. So you can see uh, this trend in growth in ADR programs from 1999 to 2013. We generally start with 1999. It was the year that um, the ADR commission uh, was formed and transitioned uh, into uh, eventually becoming macro um, and the study we looked at until 2013. So this gives you a sense. Of course, child access mediation is required in every jurisdiction in Maryland, so of course that's why um, it is uh, rather high on the list there, followed by uh, child welfare. So that's uh, child in need of assistance and termination of uh, parental rights type cases. Okay, so this just gives you a, a visual breakdown of the different programs uh, throughout the state and where they actually uh, exist. Sometimes it is easier to see it visually. Uh, and so I'm just going to kind of go through these uh, so you can just take a look at them and then talk a little bit more about it. Okay, uh, this would be a facilitation and child welfare mediation program. So facilitation uh, is a process that I would learned about during the interviews. It is actually not defined within the court rules. It largely occurs in uh, family matters when the service is being provided on the day of trial. Um, I in my opinion, it's largely mirroring a settlement conference. In all but one jurisdiction, they require the facilitators to be attorneys. There are often limited uh, issues that need to be resolved that the court thinks can be resolved if the parties are given that one last chance. So these would be the day of trial. That's largely what makes it facilitation. So these are non-domestic mediation and settlement conference programs. Uh, circuit court delinquency programs, and so this is largely community conferencing that is being provided. The orphans court. And then the district court. This is their day of trial programs where they offer both mediation and settlement conferences, uh, and then also identify those cases where peace order mediations are taking place. And then the pre-trial mediation program. So these are uh, mediations that are occurring before the trial date. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, district court criminal mediation programs. Okay. So now I'm going to turn to discuss. Uh, 
program evaluation and quality control. All right, so we've been talking a lot today about program evaluation. So um, first, let's kind of take a look at what we're asking of our practitioners. So which of these is not a mediator qualification under Title 17? So Title 17 de defines what uh, you need to do in order to be a court-approved mediator. Which is not the, the Title 17 applies to all the. Is that? I'm, I'm being told I may have referenced the wrong rule, but it's under Title 17. The same requirements exist for all mediators in Maryland. All right? Okay. All right. Okay, so actually the responses are B and D, so uh, people that answered both, so 96% of you were correct in your responses. Um, you, <laughs> you do have to have mediated or co-mediated at least two civil cases. You do have four hours of continued mediation education. So what do you need? These are the requirements. Again, apology with the incorrect reference. You do not need to be a Mar member of the Maryland Bar. In fact, you do not need to be a member of the Bar here in Maryland to be a mediator. Okay. All right. So in the research and doing the landscape, I found that there are a variety of uh, court programs that do say, all right, that's what Title 17 requires, but we do have some additional requirements for the neutrals on our roster. Uh, 18 of the general civil programs have an additional requirement. Uh, half of the domestic programs had an additional requirement. Uh, and then more of the unified courts, um, so the district court across the board has additional requirements for its neutrals. The orphans court requires uh, additional training because of the specialty uh, topic. And the court of special appeals also requires its mediators to have tr specific training in conducting appellate mediations. So some of those additional requirements that exist may be uh, the maintenance of liability insurance. They may require the neutral to have an office in the county. They may require the neutral to be a member of the Maryland program for mediator excellence. Um, they may specifically say that the individual has to be an attorney. Um, uh, and then specifically with the district court, there's a, for the mediators, there's an orientation, apprenticeship, a whole process for that. And a settlement conference, attorneys also need to go through an uh, orientation process. The district court is the only court that requires additional training for the settlement conference attorneys. None of the other um, courts require that. Oh, did I just? All right, all right, were you listening? Were you listening? Were you listening? All right, hundred percent. I didn't fully answer the question, but I think. All right, our response number of responses is going down as the questions continue. Okay. All right, we good. I know, I know. All right, correct. Settlement conference attorneys do not have the same continuing uh, education requirements as mediators. Um, in fact, they don't have any continuing education requirements. You could argue that they are attorneys, um, but then in Maryland, we don't have continuing education requirements for attorneys. Um, so uh, court mediators on the roster have four hours of continuing education annually, and those that are required or voluntarily are members of the Maryland Program for Mediation or excellence uh, agree to get double that annually, four hours, uh, as well as an additional two hours of ethic, training in ethics. And so if you were part of, uh, I forget which of the research studies, uh, I think it's the family that a membership in the MPME did have um, was, a, was a finding uh, in one of the studies. <sighs> So that's how you get on to a court roster, but what happens, how do you get off the court roster? The court rules require uh, that if you don't meet the qualifications, you can be removed from the roster. 
okay? Um, and if there's other good cause following notice and opportunity to respond, so that kind of due process that we have uh, in courts. Uh, three programs actually have a formal process for removing mediators uh, if that needs to occur. I will say that informally, um, most programs have said that they've never had to remove a mediator, and it sounds as if a more common practice is just no longer referring cases to that particular practitioner. <laughs> Conflict avoiding, right, in our, in our field. Um, uh, I, I also think, uh, and this is not anything um, empirically proven, uh, that people also just don't report complaints. I've gotten uh, concerns from people that I know that know I work in the field, and I say, well, have you told anyone about it? And they usually just say, no, I haven't um, said anything. So what are programs doing now with regard to evaluation? And there are two common tools that have are being used. We've commented on these throughout the day today, uh, how a lot of the information that's gathered is self-reported, um, post-process, uh, those types of things. And that's largely what the courts have been gathering, participant evaluations, and then reports from the practitioners. So for child access cases, right, these are the only ones in Maryland that are mandated in every jurisdiction. What percentage of mediation programs use some type of participant evaluation? They've gotten a lot of information since then, Jamie. All right, we good? All right, 100%, 42% of you said 100%. The actual response is C, 63%. Okay. So it is uh, 15 out of the 24 use some type of participant evaluation, and 10 of the 24 use uh, ask for reports from the mediator. So only eight of them are using both of these processes, and seven are using neither. When you go to the civil, non-domestic, Six of the 14 programs use participant evaluation forms, uh, and 10 of the 14 are using uh, mediated reports. So two of them are using neither. Okay. So w one of the things that we've also spoken about today is this access to ADR, right? If the court is putting a lot of resources, if we're saying that this is a what we're finding is that it does have value to the participants, it has value to the court, then let's explore how the process is being accessed by its users. And so I found that there were four main categories of why people access ADR services. There's the standard fee for service, right, where you uh, pay the neutral to receive the service. And so generally in the domestic, it's uh, two two-hour sessions uh, that's uh, ordered by the court. Uh, in general civil, it's usually one two-hour session that may be ordered by the court. The rate is set by the court in the court rules. There's what I categorize as court-subsidized ADR. So this is the services are being provided by a neutral, but the neutral is being paid by the court. Okay. So this would be uh, people that have staff mediators or sometimes they're contract mediators where that, that mediator is being paid by the court. There's pro bono ADR. These are services that are provided by court approved mediators who would otherwise be paid by the parties. So under the court rules, all of our uh, court approved neutrals do have a requirement to provide pro bono services upon request, although only three of the programs indicated that they use pro bono ADR as a way to meet access to ADR. Um, and then I put the district court program, which relies entirely on volunteer neutrals under the pro bono category. Um, and then there are non-fee-for-service providers. So these are largely the community mediation centers or, um, for example, the, the law school clinics uh, that provide ADR services uh, at no charge to the parties. Right. 
and the court rules allow the court to set up partnerships with these court approved ADR organizations. So within the large realm of the, of the landscape, the court subsidized ADR largely falls within the court of special appeals, has the staff uh, mediators as well as recalled judges who are paid by the court um, in the domestic area. Six of them use staff neutrals uh, and five use uh, contract or roster mediator who is paid by the court um, and any service provided by a retired or recalled judge. Uh, and then the criminal mediation, two of them uh, exist largely on staff uh, neutrals. Okay. So pro bono ADR, as I described, is used by the volunteer ADR practitioners, and then also um, only three of the programs are explicitly using their roster of neutrals to fill that need. All right. I believe this is the last one. In 2012, the district court volunteer ADR practitioners provided over 5,000 hours of pro bono ADR services. Is that true or false? Okay, apparently last question increases response rate. <laughs> it is true, they provided 5,150.74 hours of volunteer time. <laughs> That's from just over 300 volunteers, okay. So when we talk about the non-fee-for-service uh, providers, as I said, this is largely the law clinics, um, although it really is predominantly community mediation centers and um, community conferencing throughout the state. Uh, two of the 14 uh, civil mediation uh, jurisdictions partner with non-fee-for-service providers. Half of the domestic programs, 92% um, of the criminal mediation programs, uh, and seven of the 15 uh, day of trial mediation and 100% of the pretrial mediation uh, are using non-fee-for-service providers to meet the needs. Um, just to give you a perspective of this, in 2012, community mediation centers provided mediations for 1,330 cases. Uh, and that does not include the referrals that were made or no-shows that were occurred. This is actual mediations that occurred. Um, and the majority of these non-fee-for-service providers do not put a time limit uh, on the mediations that, that occur. So whereas the, the court has their uh, requirements, uh, most of the fee-for-service, uh, non-fee-for-service providers allow the process to continue. So does that mean we have one criminal mediation program that charges participants for the fee? No, they use staff mediators. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, Anne Arundel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we come to the child access mediation services, so this is where this really comes into play, right? So the court is requiring this, mandating it uh, throughout the state. So the argument could be made that if the court's requiring this and people have to pay for it, what if people can't afford it? And so just as the economy faced struggle, uh, and so has the courts uh, in its finances. And so with that, the court really did seek out other ways to meet the needs uh, for the individuals that could not afford these services. And so a lot more partnerships were developed with community mediation centers, particularly as a way to alleviate some of the fees that would have other funds that would have been used for fee waivers. So this gives a breakdown um, of how that is. Uh, and at the time, there was one court that did not uh, have either opportunities for fee waivers or a partnership with community mediation. I believe that that has since been addressed. So I just want to really quickly highlight some of the key findings that I think uh, are important for you all to understand for, for this audience. Right? So even with all of this uh, ADR that's happening throughout the state, there really is proportionally a relatively low number of referrals. So if you take the total number of cases and you ask court programs what cases are not appropriate for mediation, and they may give you your requirements, domestic violence, uh, capacity issues, issue, there might be a timing, there might, whatever that may be. So say that was 
15% of cases, just being very, very liberal there, right? So arguably, 85%, the rest, could be referred to mediation. And that's not at all, or ADR, sorry, that's not at all what's happening. So it is a relatively low number of referrals proportional to the cases that are, quote, eligible for ADR. There are varying mediator assignment practices. So I said that there were over 80 different uh, programs, uh, and I would say no two really are exactly the same. Even in the district court, uh, a program may exist five days a week in the afternoon in one place uh, and five days a week in the morning uh, in another, right? So they really are um, different. They really, they're customized programs. The, our, our state is very varied uh, among the type of people and the um, volume of cases, and so the programs are customized to meet those. Uh, there's increased use of partnerships to meet the service needs and the continued growth of ADR opportunities throughout the state. Uh, what we've been saying all day, there really is limited data collection. Uh, the, a lot of these programs really could not tell you how many cases were referred that actually uh, ended in a mediation, right? They just, that just those two numbers um, are not meshing. And just because the data collection is really, really challenging. So since the landscape was done, I thought it would be helpful to just highlight some of the things that have happened since then. Um, in Baltimore City, in the domestic side, there has been uh, an increase of use of limited representation for individuals that are involved in mediation. So that day of mediation, you can have an attorney for the purposes of mediation. Uh, and collaborative law is being piloted and explored through a partnership with the University of Baltimore Mediation Clinic. The district court started in April. Um, uh, mediation for rent court cases, sorry, ADR, so it's both mediation and settlement conferences for rent court. Uh, the district court ADR program has since expanded throughout the Eastern Shore uh, and their conversations to expand the growth of the Orphans Court ADR to Prince George's County. Um, since the landscape was done, the Orphans Court program in Baltimore City really is non-existent uh, at this time. Okay. I do want to highlight one other thing with regard to access to ADR. There were a handful of programs that required both parties, all parties to have representation in order to participate in mediation, or one party on the plaintiff side and one party on the defense side in order to participate in mediation. And so arguably you could say that having an attorney uh, if you need one to participate in ADR, is an access issue to participate in the process. Okay, so that is the very broad um, overview of the very rich landscape here in Maryland and was used to help us determine how we can pick the programs that were part of the study and also hopefully help people that are within these courts learn from each other what's happening that may be similar, what may be different as we look to integrate some of the research from these findings. So for example, we looked at all of this records where these processes are taking place. We found from one of the studies that when participants perceive the location of the mediation to be convenient, they're more likely to reach an agreement. So we can now use that information to go back to our court programs and look at how many convenient places might we have for mediation and hopefully integrate a lot of this. Okay. So I think I'm at my limit of time wherever Stacy is. I don't know if there were any kind of Quick, immediate questions. Yeah. So, I mean, do we know if there's been any mediations where there's been language access issues or an interpreter has been participating? So, there, there are mediations where interpreters um, are used to participate in the. Um, uh, district court, I, my understanding is if an interpreter has already been requested for that case or is available that day, um, particularly for the day of trial ADR, then the interpreter can participate. A lot of community mediation centers are working on increasing the diversity of their rosters so that they have multilingual mediators and may even be able to conduct the mediations in the individual's native language. Um, so that's another uh, opportunity as well. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> so these are specific types of cases. There's a specific rent court in uh, in the district court that handles a certain subset of cases. And so mediation is being offered to participants in those cases. Landlord tenant. Yeah. Okay, great. So we have our next session to wrap it all up. Thank you. So Emmett will be coming down with the collection basket, and you all know the drill, right? Thank you. It's like a church where you pass the basket around. <laughs> Test, test, test. into an interactive, facilitated conversation and go where the energy is. A lot of energy earlier in the day was about caucus. Some of the other energy was on uh, continuing education. There was some energy in access. Um, so we want to know from you uh, some of the things that surprised you or energized you or made you more curious. I don't know if you want to use one of your open-ended questions or you want to leave it like that and well, see where they take us. Well, you know, you've all been Many people in this room have been great listeners all day, um, and many people, I think, have things to say that they haven't shared. And others have had a lot of air time in front of the room, and what we want to do is have a conversation that involves all of those folks. And I just wanted to add that for those coming back tomorrow, we're going to spend some time really talking about the implications of this, and not everybody's going to be able to come back tomorrow. So this is a way to get that conversation going, to jumpstart that. So, I mean, the one you just put out there, 
Uh, and I, I guess I can't fill down to you the mic. Right? Okay. <laughs> But if you have a soft voice, I'll come and listen and I'll shout to the room. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not working. I will try. I, I can carry this around if people want to do that. So you could, um, our mic guy is going to go, it's not going to work. Okay, so, um, so let's, let's start with, What's, what, was, uh, what was something that came as a surprise to you? Something that you want to put out there that felt really significant? What surprised you about what you heard or, or discussed or talked about? That? And we have open-ended questions like this. What surprised you? And then if that doesn't get you talking, we're all have more pointed ones. And people, people will start talking, I promise. Because we won't let you out until there's some conversation. At some point, I'll go and bar the doors. <laughs> yeah. For me, it is. <laughs> go ahead. Yes, yeah. I was actually surprised at lunchtime to hear that there seemed to be interest in continuing to use pockets in cases and figuring out where could we go ahead and use caucus when the research is actually showing that perhaps using caucus is not the way to So I'm interested in hearing about that. So we could, we could continue, and maybe some people want to jump in a little bit more about that. And you brought this up, John, I'll, I mean, I'll let you say a word about it, because you said on the panel that there are certainly areas where it may and may not be appropriate. And I think you did too, Judge Wilson. We didn't, um, I don't think anybody's saying people should stop doing this. Yeah, I think what Marvin said is you should know why you're doing it on the panel. So we can continue that conversation if people want to chime in through it. Do you want to add? And, and that was really the point that I was making, that there may be, uh, but A, we, I, I think the way you said it, use it as a tool, not a crutch, I thought was really instructive. Uh, but we should be thoughtful and mindful and deliberate about when we're going to use that technique. What this research tells us is that there may be negative implications if you use caucus for an extended percentage of time of the overall session. That's what we've learned. It may, then there are some other things that we know intuitively uh, or uh, anecdotally about when, call, why it's important to keep people together. Often we talk about the relationships. So the issue that I raised is, wouldn't it be neat to do more research to figure out if there were case types where it made sense uh, where caucus might be an ideal way to reach a settlement if that's all that was important. But I'm not suggesting that this research tells us that we need to look for the cases uh, where we want to use a higher per uh, caucus for a higher percentage of time. So if that's what you took from what I said, I, I apologize. No, it's okay. <laughs> I think because what I, part of what I take from the research is that it really is important in terms of really resolving conflicts people, for them to spend time together and talk to each other and being able to hear each other. So the additional point, and I know you wanted to chime in, the, the additional point that I wanted to make is that um, the way you just described it is what I was highlighting, that sometimes there are the relationships, and there are cases where there aren't relationships, there's just a problem that needs solved. And I wonder, and I don't know the answer, but I wonder what happens in those cases if all they're doing is keeping people apart. Is that a good thing or not? I don't know the answer. Judge? And I'll echo exactly what you just said because you captured the essence of what was intended by my comments. And in particular, I think about the context of years ago when I used to do insurance defense work. Some of those cases, there is no relationship. The parties are in an accident, there's damages, and both sides want to come up with a number, purely and simply. And many times, from the insurance defense perspective, the insurance company keeps its own data and statistics about the likelihood of this judgment versus that judgment, depending on which jurisdiction, and is it a jury trial, and is it a judge trial, and so sometimes it's just a matter of what's the number. Sometimes, can I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond and maybe push back and use and connect this up with an issue about quality control of mediation. And so I can speak from experience and when I was involved in some litigation, not in this state, 
and was referred to mediation, and it was high stakes and there's not an ongoing relationship. It was a commercial real estate issue. I was the president of a trade association that could no longer afford its commercial lease space, and so we had had to abandon that space, and there was no doubt that we had violated the lease, and our ability to get to a settlement that was reasonable meant the organization would live or die. And that's what it is that when we were in D.C. in the Superior Court, where it's a multi door model and you're going to pick an ABR process along the way, we picked mediation. And the mediator uh, had us together for an extraordinarily short period of time and then had us separate. And he was literally using uh, used car kind of models. Are we, you know, are we kicking the tires? Are we going to make this run? And for those of you who read Getting to Yes, at a certain time I said, you know, I really wish I knew what the BATNA, best alternative to a negotiated agreement, of the other side is. And he literally went like this. He literally was telling me that that concept was unknown to him. It was over his head. And this was all that he knew how to do was this shuttle diplomacy work. So there didn't seem to be very much skill involved. And after a little bit of back and forth, he realized the amount that we had to offer was less than the amount that they were going to be authorized to accept. And he ended the mediation. And we were back together for literally two minutes while he was ending the mediation. And we said to the other side, you got to give us more. you got to give us more. We need to, in, in order to construct some kind of a settlement offer, we need to have a better idea of what it is that you want. So the mediator had gone, we had that conversation, and I was able to write a settlement offer within one week and settle the case, just based on that two minutes that we had together. So what, the reason why I bring that up is, it's not a touchy-feely, ongoing relationship. We just needed information that we weren't going to get with that mediator. And when you have a mediator who doesn't know any better, even if you're a participant who does, you can't take that mediator outside of their comfort zone. You can't say, well, Lord Charcuterie did all this research. Yeah. So you should have it together, because that guy's going to bring it together, and he's not going to know what to do. So this, to me, I'll put this out now and see if there's some questions, leads to a broader discussion about what are our responsibilities in terms of quality control. No matter what it is that a mediator is doing, how can we be sure that they do it well and, and, and therefore push the envelope in terms of this research? And Jim, I saw your hand, and then I'll go to you next. Yeah, I, I think oh, uh, here in Maryland, you have a greater opportunity for quality control. Now, let me put together a couple of them. One of the things that I found most um, surprising is that the selection of mediators here in Maryland is largely roster driven and not attorney driven. The two jurisdictions I'm most familiar with, Texas and Florida, the attorneys pretty much pick the mediators. Uh, so it's more market driven, if you will. Uh, the fact that it's roster driven here may give you an opportunity to do some training and influencing uh, in ways that would be more difficult for us in Texas mm. or, in, or in Florida. So it becomes beholden on the roster managers uh, to, to ratchet up the quality control requirements, right. and that's an asset that we have in the state well, that and, you wouldn't have well, One of the, uh, to get back to the focusing thing, mm -hmm. when I asked the, the um, mediators in Houston, particularly the family mediators, why they've gone to such an extreme caucusing scenario, well, that's what the attorneys want. They, 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 they pass it off on the attorneys. The attorneys don't want to bring the parties together. Which, by the way, raises another training issue. Who is it that we should be training? Mediators for continuing education and maybe the bar, yeah. right? What, what do we need to teach the bar to try and help them understand what it is that mediation has to offer and how it's different than complete separate sessions the entire time, right? So there's some hands all over. So let's go to Jeff and then, and then Lisa. To answer your question, Lou, I think it's to embrace and understand the dynamic that you are in as the neutral. It is not accurate to say that caucusing is bad. I mean, we have to understand what the research doesn't say. Right. In fairness. And so to get to your point about training, what says about mentorship, this is all critical so that when you can go below the line in your case of police that's busted, and get to that, what's your bat now. Mm -hmm. You have the skills to do that, have those difficult conversations, but then to also embrace that distributive dance when you have to, because there are cases where it's only about a number, and show diplomacy, and frankly, caucusing is the only way you're gonna get a good discussion about value. 
Who defended, who plaintiff is going to tell you where they really are in front of the other party. That's what caucusing is. So this is a bigger conversation. What I would say is this though, Jeff, I feel like I need to push back a little bit, and that is this. I don't think anybody said that caucusing is bad. And the statement that you just made about getting to value, I would ask you, show me the research that says that. Because I think we're sitting. Come sit with us. But okay, so show me the research that says that. I get that what you're doing, what you're comfortable doing, what you're doing, but I would suggest that you could get value keeping people in the room together. I hope so. So, Lisa, and then there was a hand in the back. Well, actually, what I want to do is, is, is say what's going on in Indiana and ask Sharon. You <laughs> can do that. You well, ask Sharon a lot. I've noticed that. Ask Sharon. Well, it's because what I am told, I think what happens is mediation cultures in the in the bar get established at the beginning of training, early on years ago. Because Indiana has nothing but a caucus culture, and we've got all the mediators are certified on a roster that the Supreme Court operates, and the courts only refer to lawyers, and there are only three community mediation centers and they're dying as my husband because he's struggling to keep our little Bloomington alive. So what I am told is this is all the fault of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's so, so not fair. So, 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 so Sharon, no answer to the question. <laughs> to the ADR Commission, which is what it was originally created back in 1998. She came with a, a delivered message, and the message was not to do what Florida did, because Florida moved the, moved the bar too far too fast, and, uh, and at the time, a, a big significant part of Sharon's work was to deal with the quality control problems related to that. I've also heard subsequently Sharon say, no, no, she's no longer there, so now she can say anything she wants about Florida. But subsequently, when she was in Florida, she would say, we're not the best, but we are the most. <laughs> so there's no place where more mediation was being done in Florida, and so, or that, that Florida. So please, Sharon. Yeah. For those of you who didn't know, uh, so, I really don't think it started in Florida. <laughs> really, I actually think it's interesting. But, and, and Lou is correct, and I, I, always, I always did say, I, I used to say, it may not be the best thing. <laughs> I wasn't sure, I was, I was still holding out. Um, but I do, I do think that, that actually um, California and Texas oh, uh, wow. are much oh, yeah. more. Oh, yeah. Caucus driven than Florida was, but so I do think that 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 one of the things that Florida did, which I, I was pleased to pass on to Maryland not to do, was that for the large cases required initially that you had to be a not only an attorney but a Florida attorney with five years of Florida practice or a retired judge from any U.S. jurisdiction in order to do large cases. I am pleased to say before I left, one of my closing uh, things that I did there was they changed that rule and now it's an experience rule. But, um, so I do think that had an impact on it because I do think that people go back to where their comfort level is and the lawyers are comfortable in settlement conferences. That's their comfort level. Not people aren't necessarily as comfortable in that, but lawyers are. And so the, the one piece that I wanted to say, since now I've got the floor, I'll just say quickly, is you know, the piece of it that concerns me the most is that people are going to diminish the impact and importance of this research on cases other than district court. And I, and that troubles me so, because I don't think we have any reason to doubt that the, that the data and the, the rigorous evaluation about what happens in mediation and what is impactful in mediation would hold true for any mediation, and it's not just district court. And, but the people who are doing these high-level cases are going to say, no, that's not, that's not yeah. true for what I do. And, and just to say, there's nothing, at least as I read the research, that indicates relationship is correlated. That, that, that the idea of whether caucus, the impact of caucus or not caucus, was not 
it correlated with whether people had a previous relationship or not. And so to, to put that out there and say that's why it's these cases where people are having this relationship, that that's why it worked that way, I, I don't want anybody in this room to be spreading that because I don't think that's true. And I want to hold on to this really important, I think, information that cuts across. So, so I, will, I will give you a sec, I'll give you a second in a moment. I, I just want to own that mea culpa because I tied that together. And I also want to go back to the culture. Um, the cultures can change when you have a strong leader. And the example that some of you heard in the immediate last session was what Judge Ross did in Queen Anne's County. When he said, we're doing ADR and we're sending all of our civil cases to ADR, the bar owned that. They accepted it. They said, okay, well, I guess this is what we're going to do. And they made sure that their mediators were high quality mediators. They paid attention to how their mediators went through training. And I think that was really important. It's hard to do, and it, and it can happen. I was just going to say, I've been very, I've tried to be very precise about describing the results. But I will say, and I, and I do hope that someone does more research on caucus, because that is clearly the piece that gets the most conversation. But I will just, uh, some folks in this room may have been there about like a year and a half ago when we had the results of the family study, and we didn't yet have the results of the district court day trial study, and we presented on caucusing. And one of the comments that came from the room was, OK, well, yeah, that's family. I'm sure you're not going to find that when you do the district court day trial. You know, when you do the small claims cases, essentially, is what, what the comment was. And I said, you know, you might be right. We'll see. Like, we're going we're, we're gonna to do that. And what we ended up finding, of course, was that there were similar results on the experience of the participants but I think the most interesting finding is that there is a result on the likelihood that the people return to court. And that's the piece that we didn't even see in the family, on the family stuff. Um, so it almost had a stronger impact on uh, sort of not saving the court resources in the, in the context of the small claims, which had not been what we expected you know, before we knew that when we were just talking about the family stuff. Yeah, it was uh, So I, I was thinking. I will say one of the things that surprised me today was to learn um, how much lack of cooperation there was with the circuit court non-family and civil mediation evaluation. And I really <laughs> hope um, that, uh, that there will be research done there that is much like what was done in the um, day, of, uh, day of court and the family mediation areas. Um, I'm also... Um, Two things. One is, um, it can be really tempting sometimes for us to frame these in black and white terms. Caucus, no caucus. Directing strategies, no directing strategies. And so I just think the kind of nuance that you've tried to use throughout, I just think it's really important for us in this room to try and remember to be nuanced um, in order to be really fair to the data that's been collected. And then lastly, I'm really fascinated by the um, finding that the directing cluster of strategies had the kinds of negative effects that it had, um, with uh, people being more likely to bring motions uh, and more of them, um, among other um, negative effects. And I hope there'll be the opportunity to drill down and see whether there are particular strategies used in that cluster that have those negative results. Yeah, just quickly, two things. Your example that you gave, I think it's, your example that you gave uh, to start this off, I mean, I do a couple, couple of things like that. I think it's important that folks get to see that. Because if you're just driven in one way, that's okay, it's the numbers, you, you know, let's just break it off. But if you can work with people to see how can I add value to this, how can I change this, then they don't give up so easy. And there's ways that you can really bring some extra value to it because they don't know how, they don't skill, they don't hear what's being said. And it's like he didn't translate what you said into something else. And so that's a skill that people who are nuanced understand and get. And I think some training needs to be done there with the mediators so that they understand it because it's very important to just run because I agree with Jeff, there are cases that you can do caucusing, but if you don't exhaust, 
the things that you can do when they're together, then I think, you know, the caucus should get the results that the study shows. But if you know how to exhaust and bring those things to the surface, I think you're, you're better off to do it. The second thing, it, it validates, I'm not sure, someone said it, because Laura did a session for the IM, the International Academy of Mediators, and a number of them said, what's been said, oh, that doesn't apply to us. We don't do court cases, we do these big, and I'm like, you gotta be kidding. This stuff applies even to you, but the research hasn't been done yet, so no, we can't. But that's what people will say, oh, it doesn't apply to us, and so we'll go on our merry way and we'll continue on the road. Rachel, I'm going to I'm just bad enough, but Marvin said that, you know, in these cases where people say it's all about a number and they don't bring parties together, you know, there are side deals that can happen. There's, um, you know, reputation concerns. There's lots of other interests. Even though everybody, the lawyers and the parties say, we just want a number, there's a lot more going on that can be explored and can be extraordinarily useful. Heather. Yeah, I, I mean, By the way, Heather, is, Heather and Alan are both from California, so throwing that on the bus. <laughs> Notice that they stick together. <laughs> I'm going to echo the desire to have research done in the, um, the equivalent of the circuit court, the, 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 the larger civil cases, but for a slightly different reason, because I, I think it's possible that you might get slightly different results. And diff results that differ between the, the parties, the people whose case this is, whose dispute this is, and the attorneys yes. that are in there. The yeah. attorneys yeah. may actually um, may actually like the, um, the caucus model because they may be using this in a way to control their clients or get um, get um, something that they don't want to say to their clients said by somebody else. The, the participants, the people whose dispute this is, may feel exactly the same in this um, context as they do in, in um, the district court because it's, it, it's their life, it's their case, no matter whether it's $25,000 or, or $100,000 or more. So I, I, I would like to get in there and find out if there, you know, what's going on in those, in those cases where there is more attorney participation and larger amounts in, in value. More research and deeper research. By the way, I do play the lottery every week. So I know research is expensive and somebody's got to pay for it. I'm doing my part. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Yes, Anna Marie. To piggyback on what Heather said, but give it a twist of diversity, one of the issues that I see is that once the attorneys get used to what a particular mediator does, they will go to that mediator. For example, I have one mediator that I know will caucus no matter what, and he teaches it, he knows that this is what you're supposed to do in contract cases. I have, I have bumped heads with him a couple times, but then he under, he made me understand why he does it, and I, I bought into it. Um, however, the problem comes when I'm trying to diversify my roster. And these attorneys that are used to this particular mediator every time, all of a sudden they don't get that mediator. One, they, they opt out of mediation. Or two, they actually go to another mediator that does what the attorney wants them to do. So then it leaves me trying so hard to get these either new mediators that are with a different background or different ethnicity, different um, whether gender. It's very difficult to get them up and going because I do have those attorneys that require mediation to be a certain way to require a copy. So they require this particular person because he's well known in the community for workman's comp or med -mount. So then I have all these other really great people who I'm trying to get cases for, and that diversity I really need in, in my roster, especially when I have people retiring, especially when I have people moving out of this county. I need that diversity. So that your comments are layers on layers on yeah, layers. Yeah, right? so sure. that diversity thing is one of my biggest you know. And it's all challenging and it, and it all comes together, right? It's about program development, it's about self-selection and self-determination, it's about quality of your program, uh, it's about informed decision making about what process you want, whether it's you the attorney or you for your client, we don't know, right? It's, it's all of those different uh, layers that you just talked about right there. You know, one of our 
favorite open-ended questions or if you had a magic wand kind of question. So I'm going to put that out to you. And if you had a magic wand, you're describing some of these constraints and I sort of invite you to visualize what the ideal future might be. And, and, and maybe you can figure out a way to get there, maybe not. The value or the beauty of our system, the way the rules work in Maryland, is people can still go in the marketplace and pick whatever, whoever they want. So those lawyers who have a favorite mediator, they could still go to that same mediator. But at some point in the future, we may have rosters that have more diversity with regard to age and gender and race and, and sexual orientation and all the traditional diversity effects, but also diversity of practice and who is going to be more likely to use illicit strategies versus directive strategies. And in an ideal world, people might be able to make some educated decisions about which they want, and you might be able to make decisions about what's the best mediator. There should be, uh, just to be, I mean, you know, I'm new at all this, but um, there's nothing different about what you said to anything else in Maryland or America or anything else. Sometimes it takes folks just to do it. You just do it. You're going to lose some good seasoned attorneys. You're not going to have people place people in them. At the end of the day, just like you said, there's the marketplace they can go to. But it means something when we have a more enriching uh, a, a panel of volunteers. Sometimes you just have to rise up and do it. Same thing with the bench. Same thing with the volunteers. Same thing with their parents. So just stay encouraged. Thank you. One of the things I hear is that it's relationship building. Whether we're buying a car, we're going to a mediator, we're an attorney and we're judge shopping, uh, heaven forbid, and we do the same thing for, for mediators. So based on that and the fact that we can't restrict who they see, maybe we need to implement some other kind of marketing program. Maybe through your bar association that they have a social with the attorneys and the mediators. You know, we don't know anything about the people who are on paper. We, we might know their, their qualifications and their specialties, that they're, you know, a nurse or something that, that makes me bond with them. We don't even see their face on a wall anywhere. So we might need to do something to make those relationships get formed so that I don't always just see you. I see your associate or I see someone else. Um, could we do that at, a, at, a, at no cost? There's this opportunity that we talked about for not only continuing education, but uh, which audiences do we need to give this information to? How do we give it to them? What words do we use? The idea that Nancy raised about this new, the nuanced way that we present this, the words that we choose to use to present this, all of that is really critical, and there is this opportunity to do just that, to teach lawyers that rather than opting out, if there's somebody that you want, the rules allow for it. And why do you want that? Who does it help, right? There's all of this continuing education that we need to do with the bar and with our practitioners across the state. I think it's a good point. And then how to go ahead and put that information out there. Other thoughts, comments? We have time for one or two more. Please, I'd Tim. love to see something on a civil case, the insurance company as the, not the pendant, but the, something, some research that involves insurance companies. It's right, uh, the judge said they have, they have a program that says, we pay this on these cases, that's all we do, we buy. Mm -hmm. That takes that into account, takes that factor into account, into whatever type of uh, ADR we could build to solve those cases, because those are a large percentage of cases in both uh, district and circuit courts that the issue arises. And, and how, how to you know, bring about that in, into the discussion of whatever we're doing ADR-wise to include it and just cut to the chase on it. Yes, we, we know that those cases don't really try, so they're still resolving most of them prior to the trial date, but usually right before. And so how do we move yeah. that ball forward you know, for the court's benefit? To resolve the case, not on the eve of trial. You know, that's a big issue. This this insurance system, I think it's called Colossus. I forget what that acronym is. I mean, there's, there are some that use this, and maybe part of having diverse practice is to figure out some other way to handle things like that. Maybe there's an e-dispute resolution, some kind of a model that doesn't look like mediation at all, but just is about getting, getting that information sharing earlier on and figuring out whether there's a settlement. So I think, I think that's a, a good point, and it's part of the, the fact that the research wasn't just about one model, but as, as many as we can study. So thank you.
Is there another, another hand? Sarah? I, I want to bring up a completely different topic, but I know that one of the, one of the uh, types of cases that was studied early on in the process dealt with the delinquency proceedings and how those were handled by the conference. I know from the many conversations we had about the report, it, you know, we learned a lot from it. Um, it's not going to be published, but it was really, we learned a lot about practice and procedures. So a question I have is where are we going to move with looking at those populations? As you look at new studies, I hope that we look at how ADR methods, conferencing and other methods can be used with those kinds of populations. The, the synod children, the families with those issues, and delinquent children and children involved in school disputes that are going to make their way to the court where we're using mediation and conferencing. I, I hope that we proceed to look at those cases as well and really research what works and how it works and how you get other people to participate. All those neat things that we're talking about with, with district and other kinds of circuit court cases, that's a population that's underserved and really needs this research and support too. So there's my plug. Absolutely. Do your part and buy a lottery ticket. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. One of, the other, one of the other things that I think you raise is that, you know, we keep talking about mediation, now we're talking about settlement conferences, and there's so much more. And uh, one of the neat things about working with the court system in Maryland is um, there are many of the judges who are in this room, and there are plenty of other judges outside of this room in Maryland, who are willing to listen to what somebody has in terms of an idea or, hey, let's try this or let's try that or let's make an adjustment or we, we think we can do better with this program and they're willing to try those things. Um, the more we can do in terms of research to show some of that stuff works or to show us what works best, that would be ideal. But even when we don't have the research, we have a lot of open minds here and Maryland benefits from that dramatically. So, it is 4.10. Uh, we, we did ask you all to open up, and you did. Lou was right, and didn't have to bar the door. Um, we, in your binder, um, you have on the left-hand side, you have a survey form for today. We would ask you to fill that out. Also, for those of you who are coming back tomorrow, you can take your binder, take your name badge, Flip it inside the binder and leave it in the crown guard room if you want. That room will be locked, uh, and so those materials will be there, and your name badge will be there for you tomorrow when you come back. But when they won't get to read all the studies tonight, and I know right. some of you might really want to read every single word in the binder before tomorrow. And then after you're finished with the surveys, you will put them. Registration table. They'll be a at the registration table. You can leave them there. Uh, so you all have been a wonderful audience. And hopefully we'll all stay and continue the conversation outside. Thank you very much.